A lot of people around the world enjoy recreational fishing, spending hours a day standing on shorelines or in their boats, casting their lines into the water, hoping to hook a big catch. Given how much time these people spend outside, often in the woods, I guess it's not that much of a surprise that they are reporting encounters with all types of anomalous phenomena. In his book, The Sportsman Guide to UFOs Around the World, author John Scott Chase dedicates an entire chapter to fishermen's encounters with UFOs and their occupants. In this video, I will go over some of the strange, fishy encounters. Three men fishing in a swampy area in Florida claim they encountered a strange creature unlike anything they'd ever seen before. It was 1990. They were about three miles west of Greenwood, about one mile off the county road in Jackson County in Florida. They had set up in a thickly forested swampy area, lots of hardwoods and pines, fishing out of a small motorless boat. As we were fishing, we heard something walking in the woods. We looked to see what it was because it seemed too loud for a deer. We saw something walking upright covered with gray hair. The lower part of the animal was blocked by the bushes, but we saw all we wanted to see. The witnesses noted that the creature stood between seven and eight feet tall and had very large eyes. He was standing about 70 to 80 feet from them before it turned and walked back into the woods. July 1987 in Dade County in Georgia, two men claimed they encountered a monstrous creature during a fishing trip. They had trekked down Cloverdale Road off Highway 11 in Rising Fawn to an area with a pond and a cornfield. When they arrived, they found that others were already there camping. After speaking with them, the main witness left his friend and walked over to an area of the pond with some downed trees in order to do some bass fishing. It was around 8.30 in the morning. I was there about 10 minutes when the hair on my neck stood up. I looked around but didn't see anything, so I went back to fishing. And I could feel someone watching me, so I turned around, and at the top of the bank behind me I saw it, standing there watching me. Its hair was reddish brown. The top of its leg was about the size of my chest, and I'm 44 inches in the chest. It was the biggest thing I ever saw. I'd say between 9 to 10 feet tall. As the witness looked up at the creature, it started to walk away. He never got to see its face, but he admits the size was breathtaking. I froze in my tracks. I couldn't yell. I couldn't move. I was just there and on a 12-foot bank. It was just standing there It never made a sound. I don't know if it was there when I walked up to fish or if it come up on me, but I never heard any noise. Something that big should have made a noise coming or going, but it didn't. The witness claims that this, this giant creature uh, walked off and he noted that it should have um, made noise either it should have made noise you know walking up to him or it should have made noise when it walked away but for some reason it didn't that suggests either that these things are so adapted to the woods that they're able to walk in the woods without making any sounds like you know like a ninja or something like that or there's a supernatural element to these creatures these bigfoot creatures that we we just don't understand Fishermen are also reporting strange objects hovering over lakes and ponds. In 1952, the Sulphur Springs News Telegram wrote of a bizarre incident that happened to the former mayor of Gainesville, Texas, when he was out fishing. H.A. Latham, a grocery store owner, former mayor of Gainesville, and member of the Board of Education, was out fishing at Sulphur Springs in Texas with his son, Jimmy Latham, 17, and his brother, Jack, on the night of August 5, 1952, between 8.30 and 8.45, the three men, each standing in the water, separated by about a hundred yards, individually but simultaneously, observed an object in the sky which caused them to holler out to each other. Something was hovering over the lake, and all three of them could see it. They described it as cylindrical in shape, 
but comparable in size to the fuselage of a large airplane, although not as long. I've been skeptical up till now of all these flying saucer stories, but all three of us saw it at the same time. Latham told this to the newspaper. Latham was certain that it was not an airplane, a shooting star, or a reflection. They observed it hovering to the north before it moved in an arc and headed off to the west, first slowly and then extremely rapidly. Latham estimates it was within sight of all three for about a full minute. On September 4, 1984, two men fishing at Alamo Lake in La Paz County in Arizona claimed they had an experience with a UFO, followed by a very strange time anomaly, though, in their case, they didn't lose time as some might expect, but rather gained it. It was around 9 p.m., a moonless night, the witness and his brother were standing on the shoreline fishing when they noticed a strange light moving off in the distance. We noticed what looked like a vehicle approaching, which immediately got our attention, for there wasn't a road on that location on the north side of the lake. We had stopped fishing and had no lights on, yet this vehicle was coming straight at us. We see low brush in front of its lights, indicating to us it was about three feet off the ground. When it reached the bank opposite the bay we were parked at, it kept right on coming at us. The speed was slow up to this point. We had a great fear come over us and threw our poles, seat cushions, and everything we had taken out of our boat to bank fish and started the boat. The witness claims that they tore off and were driving at full speed with no lights on, but the object was keeping parallel with them as they raced across the water. The witness suddenly thought he heard his brother scream out, so he immediately slowed down. For some reason, the motor died. This had never happened before, he noted. The brothers became panicky and the two frantically tried to start the motor to no avail. The strange light had suddenly stopped and appeared to be observing them. We both pulled the lanyard on the motor until we were wore out, and out of desperation my brother stood up and with his arm waved at it and yelled, quit effing with us. Immediately their lights went out and I pulled the motor and it started. I sped to the opposite shore. We got out and with great fear watched the lake until the morning. The lights never reappeared. The object got to within 20 yards of them but never any closer out on the water. The witness regrets not shining his flashlight on it as it was pitch black and no doubt he would have been able to see the rest of the object not just the lights. He noted that the fear they felt out on that lake was unlike anything they'd ever felt before or since, and they believed that the object, or some other force associated with it, was responsible for manipulating their emotions. Another baffling aspect of this case, according to the witness, was that they experienced not missing time, but just the opposite. As they sat on the shore, waiting for the sun to rise, they noted that time seemed to slow down. To them, sitting on that shore in the pitch black, waiting for the sun, felt more like days instead of hours, and they simply could not explain it. Of course, those familiar with ufology will note that these instances of gaining time or time seeming to slow down are rare but not unheard of. This is one of those cases where I have to wonder if something else went down, given just the, str the real strangeness of this case, the fact that they were being chased by this light. Um, w once the light went away, they were able to, to you know, get back to shore, but then they, they noted that time seemed to, to slow down, that, you know, light should have been, the, the sunrise should have come, you know, in a few hours, and they said it just felt like it, it, it was endless. It just they, they noted that they were like there forever. It felt like, and then eventually it got light, but time itself seemed to slow down. It was as if they were. I, I don't know. I have to wonder if they had maybe been taken, and they just filling in the details with something else. They in their mind they thought they were on the shore for you know this lengthy period of time, but in reality they might not have been on the shore at all.
It was February 13, 1989, Kopinskoy Lake, Leningrad region, Russia. Three drivers from the Leningrad Auto Park, Yuri Vashilev, Sergei Yurov, and Alexander Vitrikov, had left on a fishing trip to a location about 130 kilometers from Leningrad, 40 kilometers from the town of Sosnobor, where a nuclear plant was located. They had just arrived at the lake and started to unload their car when Alexander was the first to spot it. Then all three looked skyward and watched as a strange white object, three to four times larger than the biggest star, moved in their direction over the lake before making a sharp jump to the left and drifting off towards the east. After watching it for about 15 minutes, the friends lost interest and carried on with what they were doing. Sometime later, after having dinner and setting up camp, Yuri left his friends to go look for firewood. It was already dark as he walked about 40 to 50 meters along the shore of the lake, and then eventually off into the woods. As he entered the woods, he noticed a landed, flat, disc-shaped object, about 30 to 40 meters, sitting in a small clearing. The object was, in his words, beautiful. It had a rounded shape, with windows around it in the broadest section, and appeared to be made out of a dark material. Soft matte light emanated from the windows. Yuri began studying the object and noticed neither hatches nor doors on it. Its surface was absolutely smooth, though some indentations were visible. Yuri felt no fear and stared at the object without moving for about 15 to 20 seconds. He thought of calling his two friends, but decided against it, as he knew the sight of such a thing would frighten them. When Yuri looked to the left of the craft, he noticed a moving figure like a shadow, walking towards the back of the object. Then he noticed a second figure on the right side of the craft. Then a third figure appeared, standing between the first and second one. He thought that they were leaving and became somewhat concerned, though he wasn't scared. A strange thought went through his mind that he might be able to grab one of these men, which he ascertained were not from here, and take him to the authorities. As quickly as this idea came into his mind, he discarded it. The beings moved slowly, making no sounds, and the craft was also soundless. When one of the beings was about 10 meters from Yuri, he yelled at them, making friendly advances and pointing out that he meant no harm. At this point, the figures turned and faced Yuri. They began to move in his direction, two coming very close to him. Yuri suddenly was able to get a good look at them. He noted that they were generally human-looking, but not completely. Their mouths were tightly closed, no lips were visible, with a proportional head, with no visible hair, and their faces expressed severe concentration. They were dressed in tight-fitting gray-colored outfits. The third being stood off to the side, apparently watching. Just then, Yuri saw a flash, like a photo flash, followed by a sudden pressure in his head. He next heard a voice in his brain. The voice was unpleasant, raspy, and metallic in quality. It asked him, What are you doing here? Yuri answered that he had come to that spot to go fishing with his friends. Would you like to come with us? The voice said next. As Yuri contemplated what it was saying, the voice then indicated that they would like to examine him, adding, You will not return. Yuri indicated that he did not want to go with them. The voice then took on a threatening tone that frightened him. If you start a nuclear war, we will destroy you, the voice said. Yuri told the voice that he too hoped that humans would not resort to fighting with nuclear weapons. At this point, Yuri heard a loud buzzing sound, resembling a high-voltage wire. When he opened his eyes, he was jolted by the sight of a strange creature, which was now standing next to him, looking down at him. It was monstrous, standing a shocking 9 to 13 feet tall. It was covered in shaggy dark hair and had a head that appeared ape-like. It was so tall that it seemed to be the height of the trees around him, Yuri noted. The sheer size of this figure terrified him. At this point, the three human-like beings moved away from him, disappearing behind some trees. At no point did Yuri see them entering their ship. The object slowly and silently ascended, and before leaving, 
it emitted a bright flash of light that illuminated the area around it. When the craft rose up to about four meters, it suddenly disappeared. When it did, the strange hairy creature, apparently there to keep an eye on Yuri until the others had safely re-entered the craft, also vanished. Yuri was left standing in the woods in complete darkness. Now thoroughly spooked, he wasted little time getting back to camp. He managed to convince his friends to leave, and they did. He said that the the being had said they had, they had asked him, "Do you want to come with us?" And he they made it clear that they intended to examine him. I guess they said something like they wanted to find out, you know, his structure. I guess was the word. And he. They, they notified him that, you know, you're not coming back. If you go with us, you're not coming back. And I have to wonder how many of these people who go missing every year have these uh, similar type encounter. They, they're in the woods and they see something strange and they walk up to it and these things come out, these, these beings or whatever, they're there. And they either offer them a chance to go with them without the possibility of returning or they just take them. It's, it's quite frightening. 